Okay. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which was which which says, not which was. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary and the wife of Clopas, Mary and Magdalene. I don't know that one. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it, has, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Let's pray. Hey God, I just want to thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us to come here and, and worship in your name. And I want to thank you for uh, these majestic mountains that you've placed here in this region, Lord, that we can just come out every morning and look and see your creation and just how big of a God you are. Lord, it feels so good to be reminded that you know, all, the, all of our troubles, all, of, all the things that, that we have in our life that we have to deal with are, are nothing in comparison to who you are. And Lord, I just thank you uh, for reminding us again of that. Father, I want to thank you um, for all that you've done for us this week and for all that you've done for us in our lives. Um, and that you would continue to show us your love. Lord, you tell us that you are love. And you tell us that love is patient and it's kind. It always protects and it never fails. So Lord, I thank you that you always protect us. You never fail us. You're always kind and patient with us when we stumble. And Father, just uh, continue to bless us and continue to be with us. Uh, fill us with your spirit, Lord. Fill this place with your spirit. And show us who you are. Shine your light upon us, Lord, today. I thank you most of all for what you've done for us on the cross, Lord. Yes. That you came and you gave us our freedom. Mm. Not freedom to do whatever we please, but freedom to come and worship you and to be your children and to be a part of your family, Lord. So just thank you for all you've done. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks, guys. I want to invite you to open your Bibles to John chapter 19 as we, as we go through this. And certainly, there's no doubt in, in the providence of God bringing us to this point. You know, it's funny. And, and I make a joke, and I say it a lot. Um, <laughs> and maybe it's kind of true. Uh, going through the Gospel of John is, is job security for me. Because um, literally, I think it's been uh, over four years. So... You know, we've got a couple chapters left, so I'm guessing that's going to take another 10 years. So i got nowhere to be. I'm looking to go nowhere. So uh, buckle up. But in the providence of God, I think it's perfect timing that we see the ending of this scripture and what takes place on the cross and what that purchased for us. But if I say this phrase, I know you're going to repeat it or you'll be, or you'll be able to continue it. Freedom doesn't come free. You know that, you know that phrase. When you think about it, there's deep truth to that. Freedom isn't free. Now, I got this stat off the internet, so bear with me. You know, I'm sure you can find it somewhere else. And, and so this is an internet stat. So again, take that with a grain of salt. From 1775 to the present, the battlefield deaths that our military has suffered, just battlefield deaths, I'm not adding into it... Uh, Deaths from infection or disease or even after the fact when somebody was wounded. Those who actually laid down their lives in our military on the field of battle ranges about 657,961. 657,961 individuals laid down their lives on the battlefield. Now when you extend beyond that, I mean that thing doubles and triples. Battlefield deaths. 
So I hope that this weekend, as we celebrate the freedom that we have in this country, you recognize without a doubt, freedom is not free. Amen. It's not. Last night, I opted out of the fireworks in Thomas. It's, I mean, it's just too late. You know, I praise the Lord for what they do there. But, but thankfully, a, a willing and loving wife allowed me to sleep on the, on the recliner after a busy day yesterday. And, and, and I didn't have to go to that. But... Thankfully, I have a mother, not you, friend, sorry, it's not, it's not you, but I have a mother who, who enjoys spending a lot of money on really big fireworks, and so she brings those up, and we got to light those off, and Evan stuck around, so Evan and I are lighting these fireworks off last night, um, if, if you heard anything in the valley, there's a good chance it was us, um, my favorite one was the metallic crocodile. Yeah, the metallic crocodile was a beast. 25 of these jokers were shooting up, and then the last one shot about three or four at the same time in just this little mini finale. And, but I thought of something. You know, Evan would walk up with me, and, and let me tell you something. Be careful with these because the exposed wick on those are about two inches, and it was dark. And so I'm lighting this thing, and, and let me tell you, when that thing lit... I lit out of there. I mean, I'm running, literally I'm running for my life. And I think that's maybe part of the enjoyment when you, when you light your own fireworks. You know, you, you get that thrill of what's happening. But, but as I'm running for my life away from these, and Evan's like, Dad, run! And I'm getting out of there. I stopped, and I turned around when I knew I was kind of at a safe area and, and watched it shoot up. And just for a moment, I saw that rocket shoot into the air and bursting and I thought of the Star Spangled Banner and I just, I just paused for a moment and kind of placed myself on the field of battle and remembered freedom isn't free. The freedom that we're enjoying, and it's good to celebrate it. You know, yesterday, Mountaineer Days, it was awesome. The parade, uh, things are going to be going on on the 4th of July that we will celebrate and, and picnics and all these things we do. It is, it is important to celebrate the freedom that we have. But I want to tell you something. It's really, really easy to get lost in the midst of this and forget really what it's all about. You know, we can get lost in the fireworks and the parades and, and, and the fun time with, with firemen's challenges and all this stuff and forget that it's about freedom that we have in this country. And so I was thankful for just a moment in, in running for my life to take a moment and just reflect on that, that freedom isn't free. But here's the reality of that. I want us to, to let that translate into the Christian life. And remember that the same is true for you if you are in Christ, if you've come to faith in Jesus. And what I mean by that is, is you have looked at the cross. And I don't mean physically looking up at the cross. What I mean is you have looked at the cross through eyes of faith and recognized that a sinless God in the flesh took all of his sins, all of your sins, none of his, all of your sins upon himself as your substitute. You crowned him with your sin. And then therefore all of God's wrath poured out upon him. In that moment to die completely for your sins as your substitute. And in so doing that we trade him our sinfulness. And he gives us our what? What do we, what do we get in return? His righteousness. So that's what it means to come to faith in Christ. And so I hope you recognize if you are a Christian today. That the freedom that you have in Christ certainly was not free. Amen. We need to remember that as well because we can get caught up in the Christian life. Yesterday was an awesome time of service and we're, we're praying with people. And I was telling Matt and just rejoicing because like he shared, there were, there were times where people didn't want prayer. And we prayed with them anyway. There was a time where, where I had a guy who, who said, I said, hey, can I pray for you? He said, no, nah, everything's good. I said, awesome. Let's praise God for that. And we prayed and praised God for that. <laughs> But here's the reality in that. When we do that, what we're doing, and maybe, maybe somebody's far off from God, but, but just for a moment, we usher them into the throne room of God. By God's grace and through the blood of Jesus, we come boldly into that. We have freedom, as Devin prayed, to be able to do that. And maybe somebody's resistant, but guess what? If they're praying with us, then we're, whether they're a participant or not, they're carried along into the presence of God just for at least that moment. And that's huge. Because there's value in them. There's not one person that we run into in our lives that hasn't been created in the image of God. Not one. And there's not one person who's still breathing who is beyond the ability to be saved. Not of themselves, but through Christ. And so it's easy when we're in worship and when we're in service to get caught up in all of the, the mechanics of it. 
But to lose the reflection on freedom that we have in Christ, salvation, it wasn't free in the sense that somebody had to pay for it. And it was Jesus. So what I want us to do today in our worship time is just stop. Worship Sundays for me, I mean, they're my busy day. I'm running crazy, five o'clock, you know, bam, 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 doing all this stuff. And, And don't get me wrong, I love it. But there are times where I need to just stop, step back, and reflect. I'm a child of God because of what Christ has done for me. But yet he paid the price for me. I need to reflect on that. We need to reflect on that. So as we come to our scripture today, there's three things I want us to see from this. And we're gonna, it's going to be kind of divided up sort of in, in characters. We're going to see the soldiers, and then we're going to see those who were gathered in front of the cross. We're going to see Jesus' mom, his aunt. We're going to see the disciples that are there as well. And then finally, we're going to see Jesus. But I want us to see kind of what they saw. What were they seeing when all this was going on? Through the soldiers, we're going to see that the world, through the crucifixion, they saw victory. They saw triumph. They saw something in that that they had won. Satan thought he had the victory in the crucifixion of Christ. But the family that had gathered in the actual physical family of Jesus, but also the family of God, they saw defeat at this point. And you may find that shocking, but as we get into this, you're going to realize as they're looking at Jesus die on the cross, more than likely they were seeing defeat. But what did Jesus see? What did the Savior see as he's there dying on the cross? He saw freedom. That's where his perspective was. That's what he knew he was purchasing. So we're going to see how the world saw victory, the family saw defeat, and the Savior saw freedom. So let's jump into this. To the victor goes what? The spoil. Come on. You got to wake out there. To the victor goes what? The Yay. Thank you. Brian. Is Brian in here? Is he awake? Brian told me he kind of goes to sleep. I told him I'm going to call him out. Is he out there? Okay. That's, why, that's why if you drink coffee downstairs and you get decaf, you really get caffeinated. No, I'm just kidding. I wouldn't do that to you. <laughs> to the victor goes the spoils. You know what that means? Young kids, you know what that means? It basically means if you win in battle, you get more than just victory. You get stuff. You ever watch Pawn Stars? You guys ever watch that show? When somebody comes into the pawn shop and they've got like a, a German rifle from their great-grandfather that was over, came over in World War II, how'd they get that? To the victor goes the spoils. And so to understand it, and that actually comes from, it's interesting, it comes from Senator William Marcy in 1828 when our seventh president, Andrew Jackson, won the election. That's where that phrase comes from, to the victor go the spoils. But you think about this. Look in our text here, beginning in verse 23. It's really what was happening with the soldiers. Because the world, these soldiers, they saw victory. Soldiers here are just being soldiers. They're doing what they've been trained to do. It says, when the soldiers had crucified Jesus, and please understand this, those Roman soldiers, they knew what they were doing. They had perfected it. Crucifixion didn't start with the Romans, but they took it to another level. And they took it to a level that was, that was just... It served its purpose and it served it well in the sense of a death, but not just death. It wasn't just an execution. It was an agonizing, torturous execution that sometimes the victim of this could be on the cross for days. And they did it well. And it's horrific to even say crucifixion being done well, but they did it. And they did it through experience They knew what they were doing. So when the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments. And please understand this, and I don't mean to be overly or gratuitously graphic, but he was stripped naked, folks. And here's the thing, and maybe this is, and and, and I I don't want to see a depiction of that. But sometimes when we look at artwork, and I'm I'm not knocking Christian artwork, but sometimes when we look at it, it doesn't show the brutality of the cross. The cross was brutal. The cross was gruesome, it was horrific, it was embarrassing, it was all of these things. And none of that was shielded from Jesus. Because remember, he was one of three that was being crucified at that moment. And so as he is stripped down, the soldiers take his garments and what do they begin to do? They begin to divide it between themselves. Why? To the victor go the spoils. And believe me, this wouldn't have been the first time they had done this. This wasn't the first time they had crucified someone and took their garments and divided them. They weren't taking them because, hey, this is the Jewish Messiah. Someday we'll keep this. Maybe it'll be a relic in a Catholic church. That's not at all. Sorry, Matt. 
I had to. You're a good sport. Any other Catholics in here? All right. Shame on me. That's not what they were doing. They weren't approaching it in that manner. Maybe they took it for greed. Maybe they took it because they needed it. But regardless, they were doing what they would normally do. They would take the garments and divide it amongst themselves. One for this person, one for that person. But then they come to his tunic. And that was kind of this this inner garment. It was the one that was worn against the skin. And they come to it and they recognize something about it. The tunic was seamless. Now what I'm not going to do, and I know there there are some that that would do that, and if they feel led to do that, then then let them have it. I'm not going to spiritualize that. But what I am going to do is explain that this was of great value. Listen to what it says. The tunic was seamless. It was woven in one piece from top to bottom. Somebody made this for Jesus. And this was a special piece of garment, so much so that the, that the soldiers, who normally would probably just rip stuff apart, I mean, they were brutal men. They stopped, and they recognized, wait a minute, this is too valuable. We don't need to be ripping this one up. Let's, let's do something. Let's figure this out. Let's cast lots. And let's see, wherever the lot lands, let's, that person gets it. You know, it's kind of like drawing straws. Let's see who gets the shortest one or the longest one. Whoever does, they get the garment. And again, this probably wasn't the first time they had come across an item that they all wanted to get a piece of. And so let's just, let's, let's cast lots and see who gets it. But here's one thing they were doing that they did not recognize. As they did this, there was a prophecy realized in what they did. And what it does is it's in Psalm 22. Psalm 22, again, you remember the words of Jesus as he's crucified on the cross. And he cries out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. What is he crying out? And we've talked about this. He's crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, if it was our modern day and age and we had the scriptures and we had the chapters numbered and the verses numbered, he would be crying out, turn to Psalm 22. Because that's what he was doing. They knew the Psalms by the first line. So as he cries out the first line while he's on the cross, he was telling everybody that had gathered, go to Psalm 22. Because here's what happens if you go to Psalm 22. You read about the crucifixion. It's all through Psalm 22, written by David hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before this ever happened. And Jesus was directing people there to understand something about his death. It was ordained by God. It was prophesied by God. It was in the economy of God. It's the will of God for him to die on the cross. So when we come to that, Psalm 22, verse 18, here's what it says. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Now when the psalmist wrote this, and he was inspired of God to write this, he he knew in his mind what he was writing, but, but the prophecy far outstretched what he in his mind, he didn't know he was writing about the Messiah being crucified at that point, but that's what prophecy is all about. And here's the thing I want us to understand, that in the crucifixion, but, but it goes beyond that. God's plans will not be thwarted. Amen. I love that word. Thwarted. Just say it. Say it. Thwarted. It kind of rolls off the tongue. Thwarted. You kind of spit it out sometimes. It means prevented. It means nobody's going to stop the plans and the will of our God. It was His will. That his son would die on the cross. That was part of the plan. Don't think that things ran off course. That things got off the rails. That was the plan. There was no other plan. Jesus said it in the garden. Father, if there's any other way, take the cup from me. And then we don't know how long the pause was, but I'm sure there was a pause. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. There was no other plan. He had to drink of the cup, the cup of our sins. He had to drink it in full in that they were placed upon his head, the wrath of God for our sins. He had to drink that in full so that when we come to faith in Christ, when you reach out in faith and take hold of that, the grace that's extended to you, there is no more wrath left for you. God isn't some kind of magician that holds just a little vial of wrath behind his back and says, hey, I know you came to faith in Christ, but there was one sin that wasn't atoned for. If that were the case, then we would still spend all eternity in hell. Jesus paid it all. We'll get more into that. But understand that in the fulfillment of what these soldiers are doing, just being soldiers, they fulfilled scripture. They fulfilled prophecy. And how do you know prophecy was from God? Is that it came to pass. 
So even in these soldiers acting out as they would in their flesh, they're fulfilling something that God prophesied many, many years before to the fact that Jesus would be crucified, the Messiah, and that they, in fact, would strip him and they, in fact, would divide his garments and cast lots for them. Don't just pass over that. It's a huge thing that prophecy is fulfilled. And these soldiers, we have victory. We've conquered this man. We've nailed him to a cross. They probably weren't at all interested in the politics of it. Oh, he claims to be a king, whatever. They had a job to do. They did it. And now they were victorious in that. So they get the spoil. They get his garments. They saw victory. But it didn't stop there because the soldiers did these things. And then in verse 25, but standing by the cross. Here's a contrast. We have those who are, who are seeing victory here. But in contrast, those standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. So family is standing there. And we also know that John, and we'll get into that a little more, there's disciples that are standing there. So there's real physical family. There's family of God standing there. They're witnessing this. And I want us to understand something. I want us to to step back just a moment and place ourselves there. See, it's hard to do that because we know what happens on the third day. They didn't. And so as they're standing there before the cross and they're seeing this this gruesome, horrific, horrible display before them. This This is Jesus. This is the one, not only who they left everything behind, this is their family member, this is their son, this is a relative. They loved him and they're seeing him absolutely tortured, struggling for every breath. I, can't, I cannot portray it in words as graphic as it was. And it's right before their eyes. They're standing, look, standing by the cross. They're there. They're looking upon Jesus slowly dying. There was no, at that point, any anticipation of a resurrection in their hearts. There should have been. And when we see it, we see it gloriously because we know he was raised from the dead. But, but here's what I'm saying, why they see defeat. And you don't need to turn there, but listen to Luke 24, verse 1. Luke 24, 1 says, But on the first day of the week, now this is after he's been placed in the tomb, after um, all of the things with Sabbath that had gone on, on the first day of the week at dawn, they went to the tomb taking spices they had prepared. Taking spices. Why would they go to a tomb with spices? Here's why. Because dead bodies that are dead, really, really dead, begin to decompose. And they stink. Because his body needed to be properly prepared for burial. Because it was in haste, they took him down the cross, they put him in there. It was a high Sabbath. They had to take care of this stuff, the Jewish people did. But why did they go there with spices to the tomb? Because they expected him to be dead. Understand that. They went to the tomb on the morning that we get up early. That's why we have sunrise service. We get up and we celebrate it. They went there with spices to prepare a dead body properly for burial. So even though countless times Jesus told them, I must go to Jerusalem. I will die, but I will be raised from the dead. They just didn't get it. And and who can blame them? Please don't don't be arrogant and, man, I would have gotten it. I don't think you would have. And I don't think I would have either. But praise God, we're on the opposite side of that. And we do get it because we look back. But I think as the family is watching Jesus, their loved one, their, the one that they had believed in as the Messiah, dying, I think in their hearts they saw defeat. They saw this gruesome spectacle of an, edu- of an execution. And, and here's the thing, and, and, and Ryan, you kind of hit on this on Tuesday night. Teenagers, be shocked by the death of Christ. You guys have seen so much, and a lot of it's not good. Adults, we're we're probably in the same boat. But when we come to the death of Christ, we need to absolutely be shocked by this. It was a horrific death in the physical sense, but the spiritual aspect of it, we should be in awe of what was taking place. We should be shocked. Don't just treat it as normal if you're in church for a long time. And we talk about, and, and let me tell you, every Sunday, I believe this, I hope this is true, we get to the cross. Because if we ever move out of the shadow of the cross, we're in trouble. And again, I want your life, my life, saturated with the gospel of Christ. So that when we go to things like Mountaineer Days and we're proclaiming Jesus, it's not this nerve-wracking thing. It is just an overflow because our lives are completely saturated with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's why we sing it. That's why we preach it. That's why you should read about it. All of these things. 
And so I want us to be in awe and shocked by this. Don't just treat it as normal. Don't just make it an Easter thing. It's every Sunday. It's an everyday thing. But when we come to worship, we worship on Sunday because Jesus is risen. Every Sunday we gather on the first day of the week because he's alive. But I want us to see also on the cross, and I'll just kind of blow through this quick. Jesus cared for his mother. Jesus gives, and this is John. John is talking about himself. What a humble guy. He doesn't say, and John gave Mary to me, and I took it. He says, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved. That's John. All the, all the, the church fathers and commentators who are much smarter than me. They agree that's John. I'm going to agree with them. That's John. So when Jesus saw his mother, Mary, and saw John, whom he loved, standing nearby, he said, Mother, woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, he says to John, behold your mother. Remember, Jesus' brothers, they were believers at this point. And so Jesus wasn't going to just entrust Mary, who was a believer. Please understand that. She was a believer, just like you and I have to come to faith in Christ. She as well had to come to faith in Christ, her son. That her son died on the cross for her sins as well. And so Jesus gives Mary to be cared for by a brother in the Lord, by a believer to John. And then John adds a little commentary to it. And from that hour, John didn't didn't resist this. From that hour, from that moment, the disciple took her into his own home. So John, if you ever wonder what happened to Mary after this, John was caring for her. As if, and, and in some sense, spiritually, She was his mother because we should treat our our older women as they are mothers and we should treat younger women as sisters. This is what it means to be in the family of God. Jesus knew that and he entrusted that to John. John knew that. Mary knew that. And so it's a beautiful picture of Jesus taking care of his earthly mother while he's there on the cross. But I find it interesting too and I just don't want to pass over it. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his home. That's a personal testimony of John. John is saying, no, I did this. From that hour, I took Mary in and I cared for her. Because that's what Christians do. We care for one another. Yesterday, as we hand out water and lemonade and prayer and life books and tracts and all these things, why are we doing that? Because we care for people. We don't come home and we don't say, hey, God, look what we did. We, we shared the gospel, check. We don't do that. We don't scratch things up here in the pulpit and say, wow, we're adding to our list. We give praise to God because we care for people. We love people. We love because we've first been loved. That's why we do this. Because we want people to come to faith in Christ Amen. and be in that right fellowship with their Father. It's what we get when we come to faith in Jesus. We don't just get deliverance from hell. We get reunited with our Father forever and ever and ever and ever. And ever and ever and ever and ever. You can keep on going. That's eternal life. But I think when his family were standing there watching him, I don't think they were thinking, wow, prophecy is being fulfilled right now. Jesus has died on the cross. I don't think they were thinking back to that time when John, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming through and said, look. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I don't think they were seeing that at that moment. I don't think they were thinking, wow, our sins are being atoned for. Our ransom is being paid. I think they saw a man that they loved, that they believed as the Messiah, dying. They didn't fully understand it. I think they saw defeat. And I think on some level, they felt like it's over. Because we only get record in this of one disciple, one apostle that's there. Where are the other ones? You strike the shepherd, where are the sheep? They're gone. They booked it out of there. They were gone. They were scared. But now I want us to translate out of this and go to something a little more joyful. These last few verses. What was the vision of Jesus? What was the perspective of Jesus as he's dying there on the cross? Verse 28. After this, after this took place with John and Mary and after the soldiers took his garments, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, And look what he says, to fulfill all the scripture. See, Jesus was fulfilling scripture, prophecy, all the prophecy that pointed to him as Messiah, all the prophecy that was pointing that the Messiah must die on the cross. It was all coming to a head upon him, and it was all being fulfilled. True prophecy being fulfilled. God's fulfillment of this. But death was near. 
And so Jesus calls out, I thirst. A dying man is a thirsty man. Jesus, God in the flesh, truly God, truly man, really dying, really died, really buried, really raised from the dead, really alive. That's who our Jesus is. And so he's there and death is near. And the world is seeing victory. Satan is seeing victory. The followers are seeing defeat. And Jesus, from his perspective, knowing what's about to take place, he sees freedom purchased. Freedom purchased. I'll talk, you don't see those words together sometimes. Freedom and being purchased. But that's exactly what he's doing because freedom isn't free. Can you imagine for just a moment, and just, just try to imagine this, actually being a slave. Not only really being a slave. And then being set free. What would that feel like? In a physical sense, what would that feel like? To actually have freedom purchased for you. But here's the reality of that. If you were in Christ, you should know exactly how that feels. You should know and rejoice in how that feels. Because each one of us was a slave to sin. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every single one of us. Therefore, we became slaves to sin. But we have been set free. As we look at these final words of Jesus, when he received the sour wine after he declared that he was thirsty, he said, it is finished. To tell us die. Paid in full. It's done. I can't add to it. I can't take away from it. Everything that was needed for my salvation and your salvation for our eternal life, it was finished. Done. That's why those were his last words. And don't think, well, maybe they just didn't record the other words. These were his last words. It is finished. It's done. I have purchased salvation for everyone who will trust in Jesus. See, that's, that's where the kicker is. He's done this. The work is done. You have to reach out in faith and take hold of it. If you don't, and I've shared this a lot, it is not good news. It's condemning news. But when you take hold of it, it is glorious good news. That he was your substitute. That he took your place. That again, you trade your sinfulness for his righteousness. That's the craziest deal ever. But it's legit and it's real. And so through that, we have forgiveness and we have cleansing. And please understand those two things. They're not interchangeable, but they're both necessary. We need to be forgiven of our sins. But if you're forgiven and you're still spotted with your sins, you're not going to be able to stand before a holy God. You're not going to be a spotless bride to Jesus Christ. But he doesn't do just one or the other. He forgives and he cleanses because it is finished. Jesus was doing all of these things. It is finished. The wages of our sin paid in full by him. And I want to finish up with Galatians 5.1. And Matt, when you hit on this yesterday, I was like, or on Friday, I was like, yeah. And I had to, I kind of jumped in on it. But, but it, was, it was a great message at our men's breakfast. And it's a great way to finish this message. Galatians 5.1, listen to what Paul says. For freedom, Christ has set us free. For freedom. Christ has set us free. Why did he set us free? For freedom. For freedom from the law. Yes. And I'm going to stretch it out a little farther from freedom of religion. And what I mean by that, thinking that religion saves you from freedom of sin. We now have access to the most holy place where none of us were allowed to go. Unless you were a high priest, you weren't going in there to the presence of God. But because Christ set us free, we now have freedom to access God anytime Anywhere. That's the freedom that we have. And as Devin prayed, that doesn't mean we just get to do what we want. That's not what freedom means in this sense. That's not really freedom. You're just doing what you want, quite frankly. That's slavery. It's not freedom. But Jesus Christ, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Martin Luther. Martin Luther, if you want to read something about Galatians, check Martin Luther out. But he wrote, it's a spiritual freedom. That's to be preserved in the spirit. It's a spiritual freedom that was purchased for us by Christ. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Now, what do we do with it? Here's what we do with it, brothers and sisters. Stand firm, therefore. Stand firm. In our faith, stand firm. The world's going to press hard against you. They're going to say, oh, you think you're free in Christ? You're a slave. You've got to go to church on Sundays. You've got to give money. You've got to do all this stuff. You're a slave. No, we're free. And we're the real people who are free. 
Because we have been set free by Christ through his death, through his burial, through his resurrection. And so Paul says, stand firm, therefore. Don't shrink back. Stand firm, stand your ground, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Brothers and sisters, we've got to be careful with that one. So easy that we can submit and, and be under slavery. Paul understood this. He faced off with Peter about this. Peter was, was again trying to yoke himself to slavery by, by adhering to the law as if he was gaining favor with God. You gain no favor with God from the law. You gain no favor with God by being in church today. You come to worship him. Not saying, God, look at me. I'm here. You've got to bless me now. No. You are blessed by God whether you recognize it or not. But we are here to show our thankfulness to God in worship. But again, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Christ That takes us to the cross. That takes us to his death. That takes us to the burial and resurrection. That's the gospel. Therefore, freedom, though we are set free, was not free. It was paid in full by his blood. I hope you know that freedom today. Because here's the reality. You are in the United States. I'm assuming you're all citizens. I need to be careful with that. But I'll assume that. But you're free. We live in a free country that's been blessed by God. But if you're in Christ, then you are truly free. But if you're not in Christ, you may know physical freedom. You may know freedom in our country, but you're a slave. And I'm not trying to be ugly because we've all been there because every single one of us has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But for freedom, Christ has set you free. He's done all the work. It is finished. We've already seen that. He said it. It's finished, done, paid in full. Reach out in faith and take hold of it. Trust in it. Don't just say, oh, well, yeah, I believe that in my mind. I mean, take hold of it and rest your soul upon it, and you will not be put to shame. I promise you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you. For freedom, we've been set free, God. And, and as we celebrate our earthly freedom in this country, God, what a blessing it is to live in this country. Those of us who have lived in other countries, we, we, we understand a little bit what, it's, what it means to be free in this country, Lord. It's a huge blessing. But Father, one day, as we read in the back of the Bible in the book of Revelation, that kind of freedom is going to end. But freedom in Christ will never end. It's an eternal thing, and it's been purchased, Jesus, by you on the cross, by your blood, by laying down your life for us. And I pray that we all know it. And if we know it, help us to stand firm. If we don't know it, then help us to reach out in faith. Father, you've got to draw us to yourself. The word says that. And no one comes to you, Father, except through the Son. And so, Holy Spirit, we need you to do that work in our lives and in our hearts. And so we yield this to you. Thank you for the freedom we have, Jesus. And we ask all this in your name. Amen. Amen.